star witness in a massive drugs case. He's a snitch. Found dead in his safe house. They knew that he was in Queensland. And they knew his new name. Is this a case of cover-up and corruption? It was all over for Andrew, very early in the piece. Sitting duck. Tonight... He said, Mum, get your ass here. And that was the last he said. Where was the police protection for Andrew Petrellis? What do you think he was trying to say to you? Come and get me, save me. Our investigation starts now. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. His friends thought his name was Andrew Parker, a trainee pilot originally from Perth. But this 25-year-old held a dark secret. His real name was Andrew Petrillis. He was supposed to be in witness protection and was due to give crucial evidence in a major drug case. But he died before he could make it to court. His naked body found in the lounge room of his Queensland hideaway. That says foul play to me. Joining me to investigate the short life and strange death of Andrew Petrellis Judith Fordham, Perth criminal lawyer and forensics expert. He was central, he was crucial, and he died. Damien Loon, a veteran of the New South Wales Homicide Squad. There was a massive failure of a duty of care. Yeah. This kid was doomed the moment he left Western Australia. Dr Philip Cowalik, former head of the Federal Witness Protection Program. Your suspicion index is through the roof on this. I'd be saying you're not going to Queensland. And Alan Thompson, a former West Australian detective who was assigned to protect Andrew Petrellis. I spoke to him every day for 108 days, Liz. No doubt whatsoever. He was murdered. He said, look, Mum, if you find me dead, I did not do it to myself. He said, it'll be a gun or a needle beside my body. Also tonight, and seeking our help are Andrew's West Australian parents, Nick and Leslie Petrellis. They did everything they could to keep their son alive. Now the family is asking us for one last chance at finding out what happened to Andrew. This is about the truth. You want the truth. I want the truth. Why, who, where and when. And why is it so important for them to cover it up? This story begins in 1993 with a massive 13-ton, $40 million cannabis importation into Western Australia. Police alleged the masterminds were two Perth identities, John Kizen and Michael Rippingale, and that they had seconded Andrew Petrellis then a part-time heroin user to help store the drugs. At the time, Petrellis had no idea his alleged associates were the targets not only for WA police, but also the National Crime Authority and the Australian Federal Police. These targets were known nationally and were important, very important targets. And we're talking importation. We're not talking selling something on the street corner. And we're talking tonnes. We're not talking grams. 25-year-old Andrew Petrellis, a relative clean skin with no criminal convictions, was the perfect front man to store a drugs shipment. He's hired a storage a unit to secrete the 40 tonnes of cannabis that's been imported on a ship. Young and completely out of his depth, his drug storage unit was swiftly discovered by police, 
who then gave Andrew Petrellis a stark choice. Become a snitch and give evidence in the trial against those alleged to be his criminal associates or face years in jail. He was recruited by two detectives to roll over on the two national targets. Um, he agreed to give evidence. He uh, was given immunity. Damien, a good person to try and turn, if you like. Oh, absolutely, and we try to turn everyone we can find. Is turn him right? into a snitch, absolutely. What we call now a human source, yeah, absolutely. Andrew Petrellis was an absolute star in the sense that they needed him and his evidence and he was close enough that he could give first-hand information about actually witnessing things. Was there a day he came and said, I'm, I'm in strife? No, he never did that in as many words. Andrew's fate was now in police hands, but he kept the truth from his parents. A mother's instinct, though, knew something was terribly wrong. And I said to him, why don't you tell me who is worrying you or what is your problem? And he said, I can't do that, Mum. And I said, why can't you tell me? I said, I'm your mother. You tell me, I'll fix it. And he said, no, I can't, Mum. I said, why? He said, because if I tell you and they know, they'll come and get you. What did you make of that then? Well, I thought, who the hell is they? By agreeing to become a police witness, Andrew would have every reason to fear for his life. So not only did he need immunity from prosecution, he needed protection, witness protection. And that's what he and his family believed WA Police were offering. There should have been a risk assessment done. He should have been interviewed at length to assess his suitability for inclusion in the program. And there's there's quite a lengthy checklist that that assessment takes into account. As former head of the Federal Witness Protection Program, Dr Philip Kowalik knows how it should be done. There should have been a whole process of planning, an advanced team going, finding a suitable location for him, getting things set up. Damien, what would you think Andrew would expect? Well, it, it, the program should have been explained to him quite easily so he can understand it also the guarantee that he would be protected. This is what it's all about. It's called the witness protection for, for that reason. But as our investigation deepens, we can reveal the extraordinary contract Andrew Petrellis had to sign with WA Police in order to be given witness protection. Unbelievably, in the document, a memorandum of understanding, police absolved themselves of any responsibility for his death, injury, or financial loss. You were led to believe that your son was walking into a life where he would be protected. Absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. I couldn't imagine it to be anything else but that. He's changed his identity, he's changing his location, and he's going to be protected. Yeah. Absolutely. Andrew's parents might have thought their son was entering an established program, but they were wrong. What they didn't know was that Western Australia was still to pass witness protection legislation. So, and somewhat unbelievably, police told Nick and Leslie Petrellis they'd have to pay for Andrew's protection, something they did without hesitation and with complete trust. We thought we'd done all we could, giving him to witness protection. He was going with the police, they were looking after him, and, and we were paying the bill. You know, that was the end of it, so to speak. The Petrellis family spent $53,000 on Andrew's protection. $53,000. Philip, have you ever heard of this before? This is the, the first time I've ever heard uh, of family being charged the dollar value of providing the protection. It's never, never to my knowledge happened before. Um, it's not something that I can fathom how, how the parents would have had to have paid for every element of if this young man's protection. It, 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 just to be clear, you've never heard of anybody being asked to pay for witness protection? Never in 35 years I served as a cop, never. Coming up, I said, for God's sake, I will take him to court when he has to be there. Just leave him with me. 
Police protection for Andrew Petrellis. His car's been sprung. His address has been sprung. His new identity's been sprung. Goes from bad. There's 44 illegal accesses to a police mainframe. To worse. Is this a serious attempt at protecting this bloke? No, no. This is an absolute joke. That's next on Under Investigation. We're investigating the case of Andrew Petrellis, a young man from a good family who made one very bad mistake. He knew he was in trouble. Mum, I've been an idiot. I've absolutely cut my life, and I'm sorry. It landed him in what he understood to be witness protection. As an informer against two men police had charged and who were out on bail, over a massive importation of drugs. They needed him and his evidence. But as we've already revealed, the protection police offered Andrew Petrellis required his parents to foot the bill. Just to be clear, you've never heard of anybody being asked to pay for witness protection? Never in 35 years I served as a cop, never. We thought that, you know, this is a something that happens every day, you know, in the police force. He was going with the police, they were looking after him, and, and we were paying the bill. But Andrew Petrellis, having signed his life away to police, would soon realise a bad situation was about to get a whole lot worse. I never had a briefing about Andrew at all. Alan Thompson, a detective with the Witness Protection Program at the time, was assigned to manage the Petrellis case. We had other protected witnesses that were living with police officers. They had 24-hour protection. This is in Perth. They were not at the same risk level as what Andrew was. As our investigation continues, Alan Thompson's evidence will reveal what he believes were shameful decisions made by Western Australian police in their plan to protect their critical witness. If you were to be blunt about it, he almost didn't stand a chance. He didn't, right from the start. It was all over for Andrew, very early in the piece. To ensure protection, a witness needs to disappear with a new identity, a new location, and an untraceable trail for those who would hunt them. So Andrew Petrellis became Andrew Parker, and preparations began to relocate him to Queensland. But in their first extraordinary misstep, Western Australian police allowed Petrellis to keep his vehicle, an instantly recognisable former police car. And I said, when I had to change the plates on his car, you can't send his car over there. His car was an ex-police pursuit car. Crazy. That, that in itself is b bizarre, that he is actually driving a former police pursuit car. Yes. Recognisable as such. Why would you allow him to take this former police car with him? The car should have been taken from him, sold off, and the proceeds used to, to purchase another vehicle was not linked to, to uh, the Western Australian Police. Damien, you're listening to this. Wow. Um, is this a serious attempt at protecting this bloke? No, no. This is an absolute joke. Absolute joke. Ominously, while Andrew was still in Perth, his car was vandalised by unknown persons while parked at the Petrellis family home. And there were also unexplained death threats against the family, even to Andrew's mother, Leslie. Most, though, were directed at her son. He said, look, Mum, if I tell you, they're going to come looking for you or they're going to get me first. He said, and they will, if you find me dead, I did not do it to myself. He said, it'll be a gun or a needle beside my body. And I just passed out at that. Blind Freddy could see that this was set up to fail. His car had been identified, his car had been trashed, there's been death threats. But even without those threats, even if he hadn't been threatened, you would expect his life to be in danger. Mm. It didn't end there. 
Other police too seemed interested in Andrew Petrellis and were found to be seeking details about his new identity, secret information. Before Petrellis left Perth for Queensland, there were 44 breaches of the police computers by officers unconnected with his case. So what is the information in the computer that they could access about him at that point? His motor vehicle details, his um, driver's license number, his address. Including his new name. That was actually in the computer. Yes, it was. I would be furious if I found out there was 44 illegal accesses to a police mainframe to find the identity of my witness, my protected witness, and I would shout from the highest mountain and make sure that there would be an investigation on this. Two policemen were named for having breached the computer system on some of those occasions. Sergeant Murray Shadgert and Constable Kevin Davey, both of whom would later leave the force for unrelated reasons. I was saying to my boss, you can't send him over here. He's at risk and it's confirmed. The threats have been made, his car's been sprung, his address has been sprung, his new identity's been sprung. At least he shouldn't have gone. But Alan Thompson's warnings were not heeded. He was told to relocate Andrew to Queensland. His parents, Nick and Leslie, now also feared that this would be the beginning of the end for their son. I can remember being in the garage with uh, Alan Thompson uh, and Andrew, who was packing his car, Nick and I. And I was, like, hysterical at the time. This is when he was about to leave. Yeah. Um, and I said to Alan, I said, for God's sake, leave him with me and I will take him to court when he has to be there. Just leave him with me. You didn't feel comfortable about him? No. Going into witness protection? No. I didn't trust any anything. And that was the last I saw him. Coming up... Every day I was pleading with my bosses, you have to bring him home. The scene is set for tragedy. This kid was doomed the moment he left Western Australia and headed to Queensland. As police abandoned their chief witness. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know when, but I knew it was going to happen. That's next on Under Investigation. It's May the 28th, 1995. Andrew Petrellis is about to live behind his old life for a new life, but with every reason to believe, it may also see the end of his life. It's a snitch, what we call now a human source. As we've revealed, the Western Australian Police Force has placed him in witness protection in exchange for his critical evidence against the alleged masterminds of a massive drug importation. Andrew's evidence was the only thing that would have put them in jail for a long time. They had a lot to lose. But as police insider Alan Thompson has revealed, details of Andrew's new and secret life have already been compromised. His car's been sprung, his address has been sprung, his new identity's been sprung. At least he shouldn't have gone. Andrew and his parents are also receiving death threats from unknown persons. And unbelievably, Nick and Leslie are having to pay for their son's police protection. It's not something that I can fathom, how, how the parents would have had to have paid for every element of this young man's protection. And worse, Andrew's mother has a deep sense of foreboding. I said to Alan, I said, for God's sake, Leave him with me, and I will take him to court when he has to be there. Just leave him with me. You didn't feel comfortable about him? No. Going into witness protection? No. I didn't trust any anything. Andrew Petrellis, now Andrew Parker, finds himself holed up in a rather modest motel south of Brisbane, with Alan Thompson, the Western Australian detective, assigned to his case. Alan... Tell me what it's like. You're in this motel room with next to no protection for eight days with Andrew Petrellis. 
the room itself, it was a trap. Somebody could have just smashed the, the window and sort of shot at the beds. Were you armed? No. Oh. Didn't even have a ward pistol. I put a very good quality chair in front of the door every night. That's the best I could do. Damien Loon, you've got a chair up against the door. Oh, not good enough, Liz. How are you supposed to protect not only your witness, how are you supposed to protect yourself? This kid was doomed the moment he left Western Australia and, and headed to Queensland. It was fast dawning on Andrew Petrellis that, apart from Alan Thompson, the Western Australian police had virtually abandoned him. And after only eight days, Alan too had to leave, recalled to Perth by his superiors. Petrellis is supposedly still in witness protection, but now he's got to fend for himself. You're a policeman, you've been assigned this job, but you're a father and you are looking at a young kid who's looking back at you. Andrew was about the same age as my son at the time. When you walked away from that motel, what, what did you think? Oh, I knew it was gonna be the last time, though. The 25-year-old star witness is now on his own. He has to find his own accommodation and start his new life. Andrew chooses an upper floor apartment near the beach in Caloundra on the Sunshine Coast. But according to Dr. Philip Cowalik, it's anything but a safe house. Balcony, third floor, where's the escape route? So wh ideally, where should he put himself then? Where's a safe place? If there had been an advanced team go to identify a suitable location, it would have, it might have been a, a first floor or ground floor unit in a more residential area yeah, rather than yeah. rather than in a, a holiday location where people mm -hmm. come. Uh, and absolutely, go. yeah. You don't put them in a holiday destination. There is no exit. You are up high. You have a vision from the street. You're on a main road. Anything could happen. Every day. For 108 days, while waiting for the trial to begin, Andrew Petrellis calls his parents and Alan Thompson, pleading to be returned to Perth. He was scared? Absolutely, so was I. I was scared for him. Every day I was pleading with my bosses. I said, you have to bring him home, we can't leave him. I was pleading with them. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know when, but I knew it was going to happen. In early September, Andrew contacts WA Police, stating he has new evidence. We now know time is running out for Petrellis when he makes this offer. The last thing. Then there is one final phone call to his mother, Leslie. There's a phone call from him. And, uh... He said, Mum, I want you to come over here. Mum, get your ass here. And that was it. And that was the last he said. What do you think he was trying to say to you? Come and get me, save me. I want to tell you what's going on. But for him to make that call, you know your son? You he knew. was in critical danger. He knew. He felt so unsafe, mm. you think? Oh, yeah, knowing Andrew, yeah. And that's, that's what I live with, the fact that I didn't go. Coming up, this depicts the scene that the police would have found. I've never seen anything like that before. Is this really a murder scene? We find out that he's right-handed. He's got a needle hanging out of his right arm. Mismanagement and lost evidence. We thought we'd put him in the safest hands. Leaves Andrew's parents begging for answers. It's just a hard story to be forced to accept. That's next on Under Investigation. It's September 1995, and Andrew Petrellis is in Queensland. 
He is the star witness in an alleged multi-million dollar drug bust and supposedly under Western Australian police protection. He was central, he was crucial. But as our investigation has revealed, Andrew has virtually been abandoned. Every day I was pleading with my bosses. I said, you have to bring him home. We can't leave him. I was pleading with him. And what was your boss saying? He's just a spoiled fucking druggie. The scene is set for tragedy. And on September the 11th, 1995, tragedy strikes. 108 days after entering witness protection and just two months before he's due to give crucial evidence in court, Petrellis is found dead. I was in my office at the time and two police officers arrived and uh, when they pulled up, I thought, oh, what's happened now? And of course, he told me straight out that Andrew had been found dead and, and I just didn't say anything for the first few minutes. I said, let me go and tell Leslie, which I did. I imagine that was a terrible moment. It was because Nick came home and he said, it's Andrew. I said, oh, what's going on now? He said, he's dead. I slipped down the wall, fled onto the floor. What else are you going to tell me? That's the moment I guess you realise protection was nowhere was to be nothing. seen was nothing. I remember the call like it was yesterday. Andrew's witness protection case officer, Alan Thompson, is told by a detective on the scene that Andrew has died of an accidental heroin overdose. He was very dismissive. He'd already made up his mind that Andrew overdosed accidentally. But our investigation will reveal multiple clues suggesting Andrew's death was not an accident. You are absolutely of the opinion your son didn't overdose. Absolutely. In the time that he was away, you didn't have any indication that when you spoke to him that he was taking drugs? No. They said he was a, a good young pilot. In Queensland, Andrew had enrolled and was regularly attending a flying school which apparently involved regular drug testing. He was being tested daily for drugs and alcohol, and he was passing those tests. That's not the behaviour of a junkie, mate, is it? No, not at all. He wasn't acting like a junkie. He wasn't out trying to score. He wasn't strung out. He was getting up every morning, setting the alarm, going to these flying lessons, being reliable so much so that when he didn't turn up, that was how the alarm got raised. It was staff at the flying school who alerted police, concerned that Andrew hadn't turned up for his lessons. For someone said to have overdosed, Andrew was found in a strange position. He is naked, kneeling, with his right arm on a chair. There is also loud music playing in the apartment. This depicts the uh, scene that the police would have found. I've never seen a body in that position in the multiple hundreds of overdoses that I've investigated or, and have seen. Never in that position, ever. And the way that he's naked, obviously, it, I've never seen anything like it before. To veteran New South Wales homicide detective Damien Loon, it should have been obvious to police that it was a potential crime scene. We find out in, that he's right-handed and he's got a needle hanging out of his right arm. Now... How did he do that? How did he By do himself? That? Now, allegedly he's got four shots of heroin, two in each arm. I've been to a well over five or six hundred overdoses, death, in my career. I was stationed in King's Cross, for goodness sake. See it daily. I've never known anyone to die of four shots, one hit. That's, that's to me, that's, wow, that's three too many. The fact that there is music going on in the, in the, in the uh, bedroom, I think it's loud. That to me is, is a silhouette for a struggle to deafen a noise if there is suspicious, is being restrained whilst he's being injected with force. 
Lawyer and forensic specialist Judith Fordham is also deeply troubled by what she believes should have been immediately treated as a crime scene. The place was locked and yet there's no tourniquet found. There's no little packet with the remains of the heroin in it. There's, there's no... That's very important, Judith, because yeah. I would say in every occasion I've found a small crystallised balloon or a spoon yep. near or close to near where the body is. Adding to our experts' suspicions, there was no needle in the syringe Andrew Petrellis had allegedly used to inject himself. It wasn't in the syringe when the body was located. In my era of investigating overdoses, I've never seen a needle come out of a syringe, ever. Now, for that needle to break off, the needle's either gone in with force or taken out with, with force. force at an angle yeah. for that needle to, because they're quite fine yeah. for them to be broken off. Mm. The needle is eventually found, but then, incredibly, it is lost again, this time forever, in the Queensland Police Forensics Lab. The needle actually gets to the pathology department, but it's lost. Well, it's suspicious. There's a whole lot of activity going on here in this particular matter that, that causes me a lot of concern. There's a lot of suspicion losing evidence like that. How important is that needle? What's well, critical? It could have told us something about the concentration of the heroin that was injected into Andrew. Determining the concentration of the heroin might have told investigators whether it was possible for Andrew to self-administer four shots of the drug without losing consciousness after the first injection. The bungling was deeply concerning, and a review of autopsy photos by a second forensic pathologist would alarmingly discover ligature marks on Andrew's wrists. The uh, forensic pathologist said it could have been a handcuff, could have been a rope, whatever. It could not have been done by him. It must have been done by someone else. That tells me foul play. I cannot see any other explanation for ligature marks, particularly when whatever did it is no longer there. Our experts are left with the inescapable suspicion that Andrew Petrellis was murdered. A prediction even he made in a conversation with his mother, Leslie. He said, look, Mum, if you find me dead, I did not do it to myself. He said, it'll be a gun or a needle beside my body. After Andrew's death, Nick and Leslie made the heartbreaking journey to Queensland to see for themselves where their son whom they'd been paying police to protect, had died. We went looking for Andrew's unit. We found it. We walked the stairs up and I turned to face the door. I just felt his spirit crying out. It was awful. Their beloved son, who'd made one bad decision, was gone, despite all they'd done to keep him alive. When trouble came, you did your best. We thought we'd put him in the safest hands. And we're now to believe that it was not only the worst place we put him, we actually led to his demise, really. In one final indignity, police told them they would have to pay to fly Andrew's body home. Despite the years, the heartbreak of losing their son has never left. We carry a photo with us all the time. Do you let's go in? Leslie, when you, when you look at that picture, it's important to remember it's why you're doing a, this. It's just huh? a hard story to be forced to accept. Where are all the answers of what's happened to him? Where's all the evidence that's disappeared? In 2001, six years after Andrew's death, a Queensland coroner began investigating and at an inquest nearly five years later, he found Andrew Petrellis had died from opiate toxicity, an overdose of heroin he had self-administered, adding there was no evidence it was intentional. But the coroner was highly critical of the investigation, citing missing evidence, a lack of cooperation and failure of police procedures. 
It is quite clear from the evidence that the unit in which the deceased was found was not secured or kept secure by police and ought strictly to have been treated as a scene of crime. Coroner's scathing, don't you think? Yes, and rightly so. It, it, on so many levels. Absolutely, rightly so. He says the circumstances leading up to and surrounding Andrew's death were not only unfortunate, but could be described as bizarre and highly suspicious. He knows he's missing information. How hard is that for a coroner? Well, it, how can a coroner make a, a judgment on, uh, on what's occurred if he's not got all of the facts? The coroner also found that the two figures Andrew Petrellis had informed on and was to testify against, John Kizon and Michael Rippingale, were unsatisfactory witnesses. Both were asked their whereabouts at the time of Andrew's death. Kizon produced hospital records from Perth, showing he'd been admitted for an earache. It beggars belief that somebody as big and tough as Mr Kizzle would have to go and be admitted to hospital for a sore ear unless there was a good reason and he actually wanted an alibi at the time. I think the coroner might have even said that he, he, it could have been considered a deliberate alibi. Exactly. And so he did have an alibi, in fact. As to Mr Rippingale, uh, he said that he actually agreed he was in Queensland. First he said he wasn't, then he said he was. This is in his evidence. And then he said he was there to go to a football match. Rippingale said he was at a Brisbane Bears AFL game held, he claimed, either in Brisbane or the Gold Coast. But in fact, the Bears were playing in Melbourne that weekend. So Mr Rippingale said that's why he was over in Queensland. That simply can't be true. Well, look, the coroner makes the point that of all the people who would benefit, it was... Um, Those two those men. Absolutely. And both of these gentlemen admitted that they knew that he was in Queensland. And they knew his new name. Well, it seemed everybody knew, to be honest. You must be wearing a T-shirt. Hi, I'm under witness protection. Coming up... There is no evidence that points towards suicide. There is no evidence that points towards accidental overdose. What really happened to Andrew Petrellis? I spoke to him every day for 108 days, Liz. No doubt whatsoever, he was murdered. The son, whom it seems, never had a chance. We can't bring Andrew back, we know that. But those people, they've got to be accountable. That's next on Under Investigation. Our investigation tonight into the mysterious death of Andrew Petrellis while in witness protection has exposed incompetence and potential police corruption. Absolutely terrible, wicked, poor judgment. Petrellis's secret new identity was breached even before he left his home state of Western Australia. We thought we'd done all we could, giving him to witness protection. He was going with the police, they were looking after him. His parents had to pay for his police protection. And we thought that, you know, this is a, something that happens every day, you know, in the police force. What do we to know? We're just common people. His case officer, Alan Thompson, says his warnings of serious threats to Petrellis were ignored by his superiors. If you were to be blunt about it, he almost didn't stand a chance. It was all over for Andrew, very early in the piece. And evidence for a coronial inquiry was mishandled and lost. There's a whole lot of activity going on here that causes me a lot of concern. There's a lot of suspicion losing evidence like that. Alan Thompson says he has also received death threats and what he believes was an attempt on his life. Shots were fired at my house. We did hear a car pull up. We heard two shots. And did this all come, do you believe, from the Andrew Petrellis? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. With no star witness to testify against them, the drug conspiracy case naming the two alleged national crime figures, John Kizon and Michael Rippingale, would ultimately fail, and the two men acquitted. My, my, my name's not tarnished. 
Andrew Petrellis remains the only person to die while in West Australia's Witness Protection Program. And a self-administered heroin shot remains the official cause of his death. But perhaps it's time to reconsider that finding. Personally, I think there's sufficient for an inquiry about the, uh, the circumstances that A, led to um, Andrew's death and, um, and to the threats to Alan. And, and I think this case is one very strong indicator that we should be looking at a better way to provide witness protection in Australia. No one has ever been arrested or charged over the death of Andrew Petrellis. And while the coroner found that John Kizon and Michael Rippingale benefited from his demise, there is no other evidence that suggests they were responsible. But our experts believe that there are too many gaps and unanswered questions in this case to confidently accept the official version of events. There is no evidence that points towards suicide. There is no evidence that points towards accidental overdose. And there is plenty of evidence in terms of both motive, the crime scene, we've gone through it in detail, which points towards his death being at the hands of somebody else. Criminal lawyer Judith Fordham believes what's needed is a formal inquiry. This needs to be looked at again by some form of commission that has power to compel people to come and testify to get to the bottom of what happened. And the man who Andrew trusted with his protection agrees. Alan Thompson has carried the burden of Andrew's death for nearly 30 years. Andrew's murder has to be investigated properly. Do you think it's murder? Absolutely. It's not possible think, he just no, said, I no, can't take no, this anymore? No, no, no. Or um, he just decided I'll give heroin one more go? No. I spoke to him every day for 108 days, Liz. No doubt whatsoever. He was murdered. The views of Damien Loon, the veteran detective who spent his life investigating homicides, are damning. This stinks absolutely stinks. This was a death that was avoidable. It displayed a total lack of care, duty of care to him, where he should have been under the care of the authorities. And when you decide to put them into a witness protection, that's the deal. You're supposed to protect them. Absolutely. That wasn't protection. What was that? It was a joke. Sitting duck. We can't bring Andrew back, we know that. But those people, they've got to be accountable. Andrew's parents, Nick and Leslie, believe the Western Australian police, who were being paid to protect him, need to take responsibility for their son's death. For crying out loud, you know, why are these people just able to walk away from it? Just laugh in our face in so much. In effect, that's what they're doing. You've had to live with this uh, for a long time. That just eats away. Are you still you angry you know. or are you just devastated that it ended this way? I just want my son to be able to rest in peace. The rest of the book. And what is peace? I don't know. We've done everything we could, Andrew, and we all failed. And of course, if you have any information about the death of Andrew Petrellis, you can call Crime Stoppers on 1800 000 or email us at underinvestigation at nine.com.au. Thank you all very much for joining us and I thank you. I'm Liz Hayes, good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips 
And don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.